Thank you once again for making it to this session. My task is to introduce Ian. Ian Scott is Head of Fixed in Income at Momentum Investments. He joined the Momentum Investments team in September of 2018 as Head of Fixed Income. He began his career at Sassol as a foreign exchange trader on the 1st of August 1996. In 1999, he joined SCMB Asset Management as money market dealer and later joined the Capital Market Desk. In 2007, he became a senior portfolio manager for fixed interest. In 2013, he joined PSG Asset Management as head of fixed income, where he managed a team of fixed income investment professionals managing various fixed income investments. He was responsible for implementation and execution of the fixed income philosophy and process, as well as being the chairman of the Fixed Income Investment Committee. Ian is a firm believer in a culture of stewardship and fixed income management where investments must be managed in the long-term interest of clients. The session today is entitled Fixed Income Infrastructure and Sustainability Investment. Welcome, Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction. I stand here with a, a sense of deja vu. Believe it or not, it's now been two years since I've actually been in front of an audience, and I think we're all a little bit um, zoomed out. And I always thought that being an actor is an easy job. You just stand in front of the camera, and you do whatever you do. And then there's, there's this nasty person called a uh, director. And I had to work out that I would do my whole presentation. And then after half an hour, he would say to me, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. I don't like the light at the back of Ian's head. Start from the top. And you have to do the whole thing. And you go, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I have to do this all over again. What did I say again? <laughs> and then one day I got my own back. I literally broke the green screen. So yeah. While we're on green, today we're going to talk around sustainability and fixed income. We're going to talk about bonds. And it's quite important because I think the way that we're going and with all the changes that we've now seen with the implementation of, of the changes with infrastructure in, in Reg 28, I think bonds are going to become a lot more important in the lives of investors, trustees, pension funds, long-term funders, insurance companies, banks, whoever's in, in the capital markets, right? So this is going to be a very fixed income orientated, but it is going to be important in all of our lives. So when we look at it, so let's look at sustainable investing. And remember, we've got to put our green hat on, we've got to put our bond hat on. What's the global environment look like? What does it mean for South Africa? What do we do with sustainable investing in South Africa? Because remember, this is now the, the new theme, sustainable investing, right? This is where we're going. As we speak, the, speak, there's obviously a lot of politicians and business people doing their thing at COP26, and we'll see what comes out of that. We'll talk about infrastructure investing, something that's severely lacking in South Africa. And remember, infrastructure is actually financed through the bond market. So it's quite important now that Reg 28 says, look, you can put 45% in infrastructure, right? It's the bond market that we're talking about. It's not the equity market that we're talking about. Infrastructure in South Africa is typically financed through the bond market, through fixed income. And we'll talk a, a little bit about the way forward. And there's quite a few crucial things that is changing. Right. People, we are in a new world, and I'm also grappling with this. Look at all the terminology, net zero, taxonomy, I can't even, carbon credits, biomimicry? My word. Lots and lots of, new, it's like a whole new dictionary that we've got to get used to, right? But there's a few ones that's quite important. The Paris Agreement, right? Where in 2015, the world decided that by 2050, 25.0, we've got to lower the climate by one and a half to two percent. So that's important for investors, right? Sustainable development goals, the 17 goals from the UN. These are all important for investing, right? I'm not saying the other terminology is not important, but for us as investors, these are the important ones. CRISA, Code for Responsible Investing in S South Africa. Most of us will be signatories of that. UNPRI, the UN Principles for Responsible Investing. We, we signatories, as momentum, we are signatories to that code. And then obviously sustainable investing. It's the way we're going forward, right? So these are the four or five terms that I think that's really important for us to understand going forward. Right, so where do we start? So the heat is on. Remember the old 80s song? Well, we're living it in, in 2021. We are seeing it in, in COP26. The world is heating up. 
We are facing the harshest summers in Northern Europe that one of the harsh, oh well, hottest summers ever. We're feeling it here, less rain, more rain. Uh, for my sins, I used to live in Cape Town through the drought and we were facing day zero. It's not pretty. It is happening. It's not just thought out in a lab. We literally are heating up. What's more important, who's got their hands in the, in the cookie jar? And unfortunately, it's the guys who actually don't want to sign up. They, they arrive at COP26 with the, with the uh, big delegations, but they're actually not signing. They, they commit to things, but do they actually implement it? That's, that's the important part, because you can obviously see the production hubs of the world is where the emissions are. So obviously China, US, Eastern Europe, they are, they are the big emitters, right? So these, these are the guys making the commitments, but they've got the hand in the cookie jar, right? So who's in the naughty corner? Now, this is obviously not a hard one. Electricity, the whole Eskom thing in, in South Africa, but globally. Coal-fired power stations, the cars that we drive. We can quickly work out that energy is 76% of emissions. So if we can start moving away from coal-fired uh, power plants, and we can start move into electric cars, we can change 76% of emissions in the world. That's quite a lot. Right? So that's, that's the naughty corner that we really have to change. We've obviously seen the, the 130 billion deal with Eskom, but it's a long-term thing. I mean, I, I read the, the interview with Andre the, the writer this morning, and, I, and he says, well, look, they want to take half the fleet from Eskom offline by 2035. She says, it's another 14 years from now. So it's not a, a one-day game here. So this is a chart of the world who's committed to... Uh, making some carbon efforts, but, but the problem is here. So, so the green blocks is where the guys have actually legislated carbon legislation, if you want to call it, to lower emissions or lower emission standards. The yellows are the guys saying, look, this is still a debate in our country. We can't commit yet. But what's interesting to me is the three big emitters in the world, US, China, Eastern Europe, they all have not even committed through legislation to 2050. Interesting. So everybody else, it's not huge emitters like Canada, well they can easily commit. Your three hubs in the world, that's the big emitters, are, have not committed in legislation. And that's why you know, cop, all these cops are a bit of a talk fest because nobody's putting it in legislation at this point in time. So yes, that's going to be the key when those three areas in the, in the world actually commit to COP26 or whichever COP going forward. Right, so what do we want to get to? So it's obviously quite easy at the moment. I mean, if I had to take a picture today of Eskom, there would, wouldn't be smoke because we know that most of the generation capacity is offline. <laughs> um, but that's where we are. So we, we've got these huge uh, old coal fire power stations and we want to go green energy. We want to go solar. We want to go um, wind. We want to go hydro and all these other technologies. But we can't just get there. We can work it out. We can't just switch off Eskom. We can't just switch off Sasol. We can't not have fuel. So there's a thing called the just transition. How do we move from where we are today to where we want to be in 20, 30, 40, and 50? That's the just transition. So for the bond market, it's, it's, it's quite a conundrum that we're facing because if we don't help out Eskom, load chain will just get worse. You know. <laughs> I literally had uh, the previous CEO of Eskom jump on my table and say, if you don't, in, if you don't fund us, Ian, we're going to take South Africa down with us. And that's what we're seeing through load shedding. I mean, we've, we've had a similar discussion when we meet with Sassel. It's literally, guys, you've got to fund us. You're long-term funders of Sassel. Because, you know, fuel stops tomorrow, all our cars stop, the economy stops. So how do we move from that where we consume fuel today to electric cars in the future. So yes, we as bond funders, so if you look at our portfolios, you're going to say to me, Ian, would you guys commit to, to PRI and CRISA and all the, all the green um, initiatives, but you've got Sassel and Eskom in your portfolios? Yes, we do. It doesn't mean they're bad investments. Yes, they are polluters, but we're also on a path with them, right? So we want commitments. We want commitments from the, the Sassels of the world saying, look, there's going to be benchmarks and hurdles in time. And we want you to reach those benchmarks. That's how we will fund you. So it's not an all or zero game when it comes to sustainability investing in fixed income. So I don't want to talk too much about, we know about uh, 
sustainability, the three things is obviously environmental, social, and governance. So those are the three elements that we're going to invest, the way we're going to invest in our process for a sustainable future. That's what we want to do. So this is a little bit about how do we do it. So right, there's the 17 goals of the UN, and we as Momentum said, well, we obviously can't chase all 17 goals. That's just physically impossible. So we decided, so where can we have the most impact? So we as Momentum said, look, we can go where good health is, education, clean energy, decent growth, infrastructure, and climate. But that doesn't mean that those will be the only goals that we'll chase. So, I mean, there's clean water. We will fund TCTA when it makes sense when they want to build dams in Lesotho. Why won't we when it makes sense, right? We will fund Rand Water to bring clean water to Gauteng or Mgeni Water to bring clean water to, to KZN or Bergwater when it brings clean water into Cape Town. We can't stop that. It just means that as a group we will have more focus on that seven, de seven development goals out of the 17. So how do we do this? So firstly, we talked around the, the just transition, so Momentum Metropolitan Group has signed up to the just transition. We talked about signing up to the, to the UNPRI, so that's 17 development goals. We obviously look at um, how we vote, so we'll get a lot more into voting, so proxy voting is quite important, but proxy voting has also moved just from the equity market into the fixed income market, and I'll show you a good example uh, in a few slides time. Um, I said to you, we, we're a member of CRISA, so we signed up to, to CRISA, the Responsible Investment Code, and obviously through a CISA, we're a member of the Responsible Investment But that's at a group level, and it's obviously delegated through the group. For us, we will obviously sit on the, on the fixed income committee for, for uh, a CISA. Right, so, so how do we do this in practice, so on a day-to-day -day basis? Obviously, regulation. There's a lot of regulations happened. Um, we know that um, there's changes coming. We talked around REC 28, infrastructure, uh, practice, codes, UNPRI. Advocacy, so advocacy is the thing we can do. How do we do it? When we meet companies, when we meet ABC property company, we say to them, guys, what are you doing? What's your ESG codes? What are you gonna do in terms of your green or your sustainable um, policies? And they tell us, look, we're gonna put some solar panels on our shopping centers. I think a, a big change happened now when the president announced that uh, you know, independent producers, producers can actually generate up to 100 megawatts of private producers versus the old one. A good example, a big shopping center. We didn't do it with one megawatt. A big shopping center generates on average six megawatts. Now they can do it. So we'll see the property companies come to the bond market now a lot more. Uh, Growth Point, Emira, uh, and Fortis are already in the market. So we are seeing the property companies that are putting up all sorts of, of uh, solar panels. Uh, MediClinic is a good one. They're putting up um, solar panels on all the hospitals to be more independent of the grid. We seek the close disclosure. So when we see interims and final results, we actually go and look, our analysts actually go and look at page 160, subparagraph 3, what is the ESG policy? Where are companies with the uh, green policies and their processes. We ask management teams, when we engage them, we ask them, where's your green policy? Otherwise, you know, we can't invest with you. Active owners. Active owners mean we vote. We vote against, you know, excessive REM policies. We engage the management teams. We actually got a rule that if we don't engage a management team within a 12-month cycle, we actually take that name into what we call our watch list. And then ESG integration, it's in our process, and we'll show you how it works in our process, but also how is ESG integrated in the names that we invest with, right? And then we report it. So it's a, you can see it's a, it's a very, very intricate process. What we are busy here with is very similar to when credit rating started in 80s, 90s, really come into the market. We're exactly in, in that same process. We're busy quantifying ratings, call it ESG ratings, similar to credit ratings. But what we don't want to create is a race to the bottom where, you know, my fund is greener than your fund. Uh, what we need to get to is that everybody contributes something, get involved, but not getting to a race to the bottom. So this becomes interesting. So I said to you, we, we carry, I carry a fixed income hat, but I also look at, at multi-asset. Now I think sustainability brings something very interesting to our table. If you think about a multi-asset portfolio, 
you've got equities and an equity block, and you've got property, you've got alternatives, and you've got fixed income. And each of them has got a benchmark. Equities is cap SWIX, and if you think about alternatives, they've probably got some of a real return. You think about property, it's got JSAP or SAPI, and fixed income, you've got Taibos, Sa Steffi, Orbi, whatever. Very different risk profiles. We know about the risk profiles, right? Look, they all look very different. Investment horizons, look, cash is an overnight thing. Bonds is a three-year story. Alternatives, equities, properties is five years. So every asset class looks very different, and then there's obviously the whole difference between income-generating assets versus capital assets, right? So we're talking very different investment styles, outcomes. But I think sustainability brings it together. And I'll show you in a very good example why in a multi-asset, where we're taking these very siloed asset classes and we're going to bring them together. And it, and it sounds funny, but I'll show you a good example now how we'll do it. Right. This is say, so how do we ESG invest? So there's three styles at the moment globally. This is not a South African thing. Firstly is negative screening. So negative screening means there are industries where we will not go. So if you don't like the polluters, I'm not putting Sassel or Eskom in my portfolio. That's negative screening. I don't care what the price is. I don't care how good the investment is. They're just out. Then there's ESG integration. And then you say, look, what's ESG integration? It says, well, I want to be in the industrial sector. And then I'm going to look at which company in the industrial sector has got the best ESG score or the best ESG rating. So I go through Bitfest and Baller World and Cup. And which one has got the best ESG score? And I pick that one. But I don't care what the P is, or I don't care what the, wh what the valuation is. That's the one I choose. And then there's the real one. It's impact investing. Now, that's the one we want to get to. Where you mix it and you say, well, look, this is the valuation makes sense, the price makes sense, the risk makes sense, and this company really is doing its bit in terms of the environment, social, whatever it may mean. That's where I want to go. Right, so how does it integrate? So how does it work in the real world then? When I say, well, we'll bring this all together. So look at an IPP, a typical independent power producer. There's three ways. So there's a life cycle with three stages in an IPP. First, you get the construction phase. So this is when they actually build the wind farm, the solar farm, to deliver power into the ESCOM grid, right? Now, typically, if you think about it, that phase would be financed by the banking system, equity players, private equity players, um, alternatives, the property teams, whatever, right? That was always their domain. That's where they play open-ended risk, larger returns. That's the construction phase because there's a lot of uncertainty, higher rates. Then you get the delivery phase, right? And that's typically where fixed income will come in. So suddenly, well, not suddenly, the, the IPP is built and it's ready to to, what do they call it, harmonize it with the grid, and it delivers power into the ESCOM grid. Now it's basically a cash flow stream. So now what we do is we buy the cash flow stream. Now typically what would happen is um, a bank, typically that financed the construction phase, would then sell it off to investors like ourselves, saying, look, we as a bank, we want the risk on the balance sheet. We don't necessarily want the, the, the fixed income stream because it's a delivery take-up stream. We'd rather sell it to, to the alternatives, high yield, or to the fixed income, to the bond, or to, to the cash guys, right? And then the third part is, through a life cycle, is obviously capex and, and expansion. And then once again, you get this mixture of assets. Then the fixed income guys, the equity guys, the alternative guys get in again. But you can see it was very fragmented. If you look at um, series one to five of the IPPs, it was always a bank and DFIs, whatever, and they sell it off to the asset managers. Now, I think in the future, why can't we, as asset managers and life goes, actually fund that whole stream? Because we've got all the teams. We've got a property team. We've got an alternatives team. We've got an equity team. We can actually fund the IPP ourselves through the whole life cycle. And you say, well, why would you do it? Because remember, we've got policyholder assets and shelter assets with 90-year liabilities. We can actually take that duration. We can actually fund a 60-year um, power station or IPP. We can do it. We can take the duration. We're always looking because of the convexity in our portfolios. I don't want to get technical, but we can take that duration. For banks, it's not attractive to put 50, 60 assets on the, on the books anymore because there's capital. It costs them money. So what we say is I think the asset management industry is going to be a lot more involved in IPPs than where they were years ago. 
Right, and this is how it plays out in our process. So remember when we lend or invest with a counterparty, we always had the financial metrics and the credit ratings and the opinions and the analyst view. And we got to an assessment of the credit quality. Remember in fixed income, there's, there's two parts. It's obviously probability of default, so we want to make sure that we get our money back. And secondly, we get our coupon or our interest that rewards us for the risk that we take. Now, we've put that third block in there and I've just blown it up. ESG is entered. So now it becomes quite interesting. So we've got a scoring system. And I said to you, very much like ratings, remember credit ratings also works this way. You put in a whole lot of criteria, you score the criteria, and at the end, your model kicks out a credit rating, a double A or a single A or a triple B or whatever it is. This has become very similar. So in our process, we've got ESG now, and you can clearly see that we still have all the financial metrics, but now that environmental, social, governance angle is in. So now when we look at a name, there's obviously the financial metrics and there's an ESG score. The more interesting part is, does the ESG score gong out the financial metrics? So the guys can have a great valuation story, but if ESG doesn't make it, do you actually not invest? And it's a yes and no story because our mandates at this point in time, we'll get to it, doesn't allow for some sort of ESG adjusted returns. So a good example is how does ESG, for example, kick something out of, out of our process at the moment? Well, you can work out that certain SOEs, and we'll not name names, certain municipalities will just be kicked out because of governance and financial metrics. So ESG, yes and no, is starting to gong out certain names in our process. So it's interesting to see. Typi typically like um, credit ratings did in the 90s, early 2000s when it started, when we said, Ooh, we'll buy triple A's and double A's, but when we get to triple B's, maybe not th that type of thing. Today we're happy to, to buy triple B's. Exactly the same. So do we say, you know, these guys are polluters, but the governance is okay, yes, no type thing. So this is, this is where it's going in terms of processes. Now we say that, look at bonds. This is a typical bond profile, right? So if you look at the cash flow stream of a, of a bond, why do we think that bonds is a great investment for IPPs, for sustainable bonds? Obviously, you have the capital drawdown on one day, so we pay capital to, to the company or the entity that we lend to. Then there's regular coupon payments. Now, you can clearly see the difference. So a nominal bond pays the same coupon, the 10, 10, 10, until maturity, and you get 110 back at the end. An inflation bond obviously grows with inflation, you get like 114 back at, at the end. But you can also have, remember, it's not like equities, you can also have it in floating rate notes, or you can have it in an amortizing uh, phase, and, and a lot of these IPPs do like amortizing bonds, like a bond, where it says, well, every month or every six months that you pay us a coupon, there's a capital repayment as well. For us, that's cool, we'll take it. There's no bullet at the end. And that's why it's always been interesting that if you think about the big infrastructure products in South Af uh, projects in South Africa, they've always been debt funded because you can structure debt funding. It's not like equity funding. Equity is static and there's all sorts of, of hurdles. A bond you can create the way you want to and it makes sense for these IPPs, for the infrastructure guys, to create a bond that suits their repayment profile. And we think this will continue and it will grow. So, I, before we get into, into big into sustainability, I, I think there's one or two things that we need to say is we have to look at benchmarks. What is it actually? Do we have risk adjust, uh, well, ESG adjusted benchmarks? And then we'll get into, into premiums and, and discount and what does sustainability actually cost? Okay, so let's get into sustainability. There's four types of bonds that you get. First is the green bond. So the green bond makes sense. I mean, that's typically your independent power producers, your wind farms, solar farms. Then you get social bonds. Now, social bonds is for the betterment of society, typically student accommodation, um, food security, uh, the cleaning of water. That's where sustainability bonds are coming to play. Then you get the sustainability, uh, sorry, that was social bonds. Then you get sustainability bonds. You can see I'm also trying to learn all this terminology. Then sustainability bonds is a combination of green bonds and social bonds, right? And then the fourth one, where the South African companies are quite involved with is what we call sustainability link bonds. Now, that's a quite interesting thing where they borrow for a project, it could be green, social, whatever. 
But when they meet certain targets, especially on um, carbon reduction, so where they put up solar panels on the roofs, and they meet certain hurdles, the coupon steps down, right? They actually pay a lower interest rate, a borrowing cost, if they meet the hurdles. If they don't meet them, the coupon steps up. See what I'm saying to you, that a bond is a very flexible way of financing these type of projects. But now it's quite interesting. What does it mean for our investors? All right, and we'll get into that. So what does a global market look like? So there's nearly a trillion dollars worth of sustainable bonds in the world. And you can see it's, it's obviously split between green, social, sustainability bonds. But it's quite interesting how the sustainable, sustainable linked bonds have grown over the last year. Initially, we started with green. Now we're getting into this targets and hurdles, right? But a trillion dollars, so, so that's, that's substantial in the world. Interesting. In the globe. So how important is ESG? And this was a survey done with European investors in, in mind where they say, look, They've got a strong focus on ESG, and we are already looking to ESG, and ESG is part of the process. So Europe is, is running ahead with this. They've been doing this for quite a while. So ESG is quite important to them. They've got ESG benchmarks in their portfolios, right? So very little of, you can see basically no one is saying that ESG is not important to them anymore. If we look at emerging markets, a very different story. ESG is not critical at the moment, only 20, 21% odds say, well, this is critical to us, but the bulk say, look, it's like us. We've got the processes in place, it's important, but we're only getting there. I think the part that's, that's, really, miss the part that's really missing is that there's very little benchmarks in there. It's quite important that we've got no benchmarks yet is ESG. Now, for, for the retirement industry, we need to go there. If you want to get sustainability in your pension fund. You need to incentivize your asset manager to go that route. Otherwise, we'll just continue on the way we are in a sense. But once our benchmarks change, we've got to change our behavior, our investing behavior. And that's what's needed in emerging markets. So what does our own green bond market look like? It's about a, a 10 billion market at this point in time, but you can clearly see that we're also very similar to Europe. We started with, sorry, we started, with, oh, we, are. we started with green bonds, and now you can clearly see sustainability linked bonds has been the major issuance this year. Why? Companies love to have these hurdles, right? Because we've incentivized them. Remember what I said to you? We've, we've told the emiras of the world, we've, we've told the, <coughs> the, the property companies, the medical clinics of the world, you put up the solar panels, you show to us, you've reduced your carbon footprint you can have a lower coupon. But that's got implications for us as asset managers as well. So who's the major issuers in this market, right? So we'll talk about the, the names. Obviously, you would not be surprised that the banks are there. But remember, the banks are more in the IPPs. They were in around one to five of the, of the IPPs. More importantly, as we're starting to see the munis come to, to this market, City of Joburg. But yes, obviously, we'll, we'll get to issue because there's obviously governance issues around the, the munis. DBSA, that's an important one, as well as IDC. Because mem remember, this is going to be driven, the infrastructure fund sits in the DBSA. That's where infrastructure is going to be driven from. So we've got to watch closely what happens to, to DB, DBSA right there. I think the part that's still missing here is the asset managers, right? No coronation, no momentum, no no sunlum, you need to get onto that, you know, to that pie chart, right? So who, what type of, of bonds have been typically been issued? You can see we've basically started with green bonds, as we said, and we've actually moved all this way, all the spectrum, all the way to sustainably linked bonds. So it seems like the flavor of the month is the sustainably linked bonds in South Africa. But what did asset managers say? What's important to them? Now, they can, you can clearly see this is, this is our fiduciary duty. We said the credit quality of the name still remains the important part. We have to make sure that our clients will not lose their money and they'll get our coupons. Then, we, then the guys say, but look, we understand that ESG is becoming important. It's part of our process. We're putting it in our process. 
But the part that's missing is, yeah, it's the ESG mandate. No ESG mandates at this point in time. So I'm saying to the trustees and to the boards and the principal officers, you guys, you've got to have your meetings, talk to your actuaries and consultants. We have to have an active change of benchmarks to change the behavior of asset managers to make this, this ESG process work. That's, that's, that's our biggest challenge in emerging markets. So if we move to the other side, if we look at the issuers, and this was a survey done by RMB around which is the, the favorable bonds. It's somewhere between green bonds, sustainable bonds. You can see that the sustainability bonds have really picked up over the last year or more. Now, this, remember I said to you the coupon moves up or down depending what we call step up or step down. So when the targets are met, right, the coupon steps down, but by how much? So we call this the greenium or the green premium, right? So how much is that green premium? So it's quite interesting around what asset managers said. So asset managers said, look, if Emira Property Fund, and I'm just using them for example, there's many others, actually meets their hurdles, right? They can have between, call it 10 to 15 basis points of coupon premium back. So they had a 10% premium that, or coupon that they paid, now it can be 985. Now you think it doesn't matter, but you do it over a while for a 20 year bond, it's millions of rands of saving for a property company on, a, on billions of debt, right? So this is, this is meaningful. Very similar, asset managers said that if they don't meet their hurdles, how much more premium will we take? And the asset managers once again said, look, let's call it nearly 70% of asset managers said, let's say between 10 and, and 20 basis points. So if you don't meet your hurdles, your coupon goes from 10 to 10, 20. I think that's fair, upside, downside risk. But you can clearly now see what it means. And the question I will pose is, why do we tell our end investors we, that in, that's in the investment industry? Because we're making forecasts to clients saying to them, look, we're going to give you an 8 or a 9% return in fixed income for the next year. But now we've got this. Now we suddenly say, but if these guys make their hurdles, we're going to give you a lower return. Now, is our clients going to accept that return for being green? I don't have the answer to that. But you can work it out that suddenly the yields on some of our funds are going to drop because these guys meet their hurdles. They're going to pay us less coupon. So you understand? So we will have to have a very honest discussion with our clients around greeniums. And are they willing to accept low returns to be sustainable? Interesting concept. Right. Let's get to governance. And this is obviously the big stickler in, in South Africa is what is important and um, once again, investor protection really sits up there, right? So it's quite important. We're not, because we're in this ESG green world, we're not going to let it slip that we make sure of our fiduciary duty that you get your money back as investors. Safety of returns, getting our coupons back. But we do understand that there, there's a process, but we will be active investors. We'll keep on voting and we'll show it in our, in our process. So, Why do, when they ask the, the, the companies, why do they issue these social bonds or, or, or sustainability bonds, quite an interesting but honest answer is that we're capitalizing the market trend. Interesting. So these guys say, well, we'll issue the green bond, we'll put up the solar panels, because it's a fad, you can give us the funding, and if we can get the lower coupon, well, then Bob's your uncle, we've done what we wanted to do. So, um, Sincerity here, so you understand why we want to be active owners here, because companies aren't always truthful with us. I, I thought in, a, in an anonymous survey that was quite an interesting thing to say from companies, we'll issue the bonds because the market is giving us the opportunity, not because we believe this is the right thing to do. Interesting little anecdotal. Right, so when we engage with companies, and we engage with companies daily and their management teams, especially when they, they have results in, in AGMs, and we vote on the AGMs. Now, these are obviously a, a lot of issues that Momentum has raised with these specific companies around shielding, remuneration, directors' appointments, and we'll get into to the issues. But there's one that, that we raised was NetBank, and I raised this one personally, with, and we went right to the top. So we all read in the paper, <coughs> the, let's call it 
that black box of trades that NetBank did with the Transnet Second Defined Benefit Pension Fund, and we, those swaps weren't above board, I raised it when the regiment story came out. And um, it went right to the top, and we had a, a, a very one-on-one -on -one meeting with um, Mike Brown and the NetBank board around this. And they said to us, look, look, we're not investigators. We, we only read and we only find so much in, as we can in terms of information. And NetBank promised they did the investigations. Everything was above board. I'm still not convinced, but so be it. We're not investigators. But, I mean, in, it was in a paper a week or two ago that NetBank has now settled with the Transnet Second Defined Benefit around the swaps. Because I don't know how you ever reverse it. But it says to you that, yes, we are not... Uh, voters because we're not equity holders, but it doesn't mean that we can't engage management teams, you know, a bank like NetBank, and take them on and say, look, we don't like what's going on here, you come and tell us what's going on. And that's exactly what we did here. This is the issues. Why do we vote? Where did we vote negatively? Clearly, election of directors, REM, REM policies, um, issuing of shares. It's quite interesting. When our e remember, we don't vote, but our ESG analysts vote. And I looked at it, when I looked at it, and it's these four ones, 80% of the resolutions that we voted against was around remuneration, awarding of um, benefits to directors. So we think companies are above, or above board, I'm not saying they're not above, but they're also not afraid to go and award their directors, and we vote against it, and we'll keep on voting against it, against excessive remuneration on boards. That's what we believe our governance is. That's why we vote. We want to be active owners and we want to live that in our process. So before we get into infrastructure, I'll end off and I just want to say, we talked around premiums, premiums, but we, we have to think about how do we bring this, this social investing, this green investing into our process. Once again, I'll reiterate benchmarks, please. Think about benchmarks in your, in your committee meetings and how do we change the behavior, how do we incentivize our asset managers to go this route. All right, let's get into infrastructure. Infrastructure, right, Cutsy Dam. We know this. We need more of this. This is, this is phase one. Cutsy Dam or Holly Dam is phase one of water. If we don't fix this, in a few years' time, Gauteng is going to run out of water. We, we need to go and build more Holly Dam. Remember, there was five dams planned. We're still busy with the third one. We actually need them. So we know we need this, right? Rails. Do we need to talk more about rail? I mean, I was quite shocked about to, hear, to read this morning about the unqualified audit report now at Transnet. And we don't even have to talk about this is This is major to us. Ports. More Transnet issues. We know there's a lot of issues with the ports. We need a lot of infrastructure here, right? So roads. Here for us in Gauteng, we probably don't have to talk much around GFIP and then the, the IPPs. I think it's quite important we understand a few things. Is that, remember, firstly, infrastructure in South Africa was always SOE driven. All these, all these infrastructure that I showed you belongs to a SOE, right? ECTA, Sprasa, Transnet, Transnet, Sandrail, we can go on. You know, it, I haven't even put Eskom up here. And they were always financed through debt. And people say, yeah, but debt is expensive. And, and I always remind people, when I joined this market nearly 25 years ago, would you believe it? Would you believe this? That to buy an Eskimo Transnet bond was trading at a 40 basis point premium, right? So if a government bond in 1996 was trading at 9%, the Transnet and ESCOM bonds were trading at 8.5 or 8.40 or whatever. You had to pay a premium to buy an ESCOM bond and a Transnet bond. That's how strong their balance sheets were, right? Give you a good idea. I'll give you another one. Ikuruleni municipality in the early 2000s, it was so well run. They had a double A rating and we were happy to lend money to Ikuruleni. Yeah, we talk, yeah, we're standing in Ikuruleni. We were happy to lend money to Ikuruleni at like 100 basis points, or not even 100 basis points, over the RSA government, 10 year government bond. Today, we will probably not give one year money to Ikurulini. I mean, what's their rating now? Probably triple B, at, not even triple B at best, it's probably double B. It shows you what can happen, right? But it shows, also shows you, you can fix it. You can fix it, right? 
So there's obviously, we know about the issues, uh, the governance issues, the, the financial issues. I think what's important here to understand is that there's going to be a different funding model. It's not going to be the same as in the good old days that ESCOM or Transnet or Ecruini comes to us, says, well, we've got a strong balance sheet, prudent fiscal management, we want to borrow 10 years, you know, what's the spread, are you happy? There's a co-funding model, uh, it was about two weeks ago, I sat on a, on a big co-funding model with international DFIs as well, national treasury, banks, asset managers. There's going to be a co-funding model. And it seems like it's going to be interesting that the co-funding model will work in, in obviously a few various ways, that either it will be th through the infrastructure fund of, of DBSA, and then the DBSA will, not guarantee it, but obviously put it on their balance sheet and then sell off the notes to the asset managers, or there will be a major co-funding deal where a big DFI, call it KFW, the European Investment Bank, whoever, African Development Bank, comes into the market. They take the whole infrastructure product, call it a dam, a rail line, they'll put it on their balance sheet and they'll issue EIB guaranteed or backed notes to the South African market. Now, I think that's a good way to fund it. So it means that it won't be the SOE financing and we just always look towards the, the South African government. We'll look towards the, these, these big DFIs in the world and maybe that will solve this pressure that we have with governance and with a shortage of capital in terms of, of financing the, the infrastructure deals. What's important is that, remember, we remain structural funders of the economy. So what, is, what does a fixed income team do? What does a bond manager do? We fund the economy, right? We're just long-term bank funders, if you think about it. A bank likes to fund up to 20 years. Those, those are the longest type funds that they do because of capital. But as I said to you, we don't mind doing 50-year deals because we've got 50 or 60-year annuities to cover on the other side. We want to be part of that discussion. Right, so that's infrastructure. But we need to do it. We, we just have to find a, a way to do it. And then I want to end off. And I want to say that th there's a few next steps. And it's quite important to understand how the environment is changing around us. I don't know if you want to call them greenies, I hope I don't offend anyone, but the greenies are rising. Look at the German election about a month ago. The Green Party won the most, right? It means they come with a green mandate. It means they want to regulate us more. So we rather want to be part of that discussion, right? We, we are the asset management industry. We don't want to be regulated from out there. We want a seat at the table. We as trustees of clients' money, of long-term savings, we need a seat at the table when we are seeing these changes. Because we want to do this. It, it is the right thing to do. So I think there's a way to do it. We just have to, to find the way to do it. But we're on this journey, and as I said, we don't want to race to the bottom. What we want to do is we want to get all the funders to do something. Even if you choose one of those sustainable goals to go, go for it. But we need to, need to do it. So I'm going to leave it there and say, well, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. And then, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting new world out there for, as you can see for me as well, between sustainability bonds, social bonds, and, and all the nuances in between. So I'm um, quite happy to, to take questions. Yes, sir. I think the blue jeans, the emerald with the blue, you have first Yes. <laughs> Money on, uh, on rail network or container depot, and then Portnet or Transnet still run that infrastructure. If it went the concession route, then I would feel more confident in ploughing in capital into um, into the concessionaire, for instance. Absolutely. Totally so, agree. is there is there any, so the, the question is: Is there any way um, um, your sector can pressurise? government into instilling confidence by outsourcing it to concessionaires? No, look, I don't, I don't want to talk about politics because I, I don't know anything about politics. No, no, I'm just, no. But what we'll do is, uh, remember we said we're active owners, right? What we're saying to you is, you're totally right, so PPPs are going to be the way to do it. But what we're also saying is we, we want to say in it. So, you know, with we're inherently involved with this, this default of, of land bank that's now going on for more than 18 months or whatever. I, I can tell you we've learned a lot of lessons around um, SOEs and the way that National Treasury is thinking about SOEs. So 
I want to say to you, I, I think that's the way we're going to go. And, and this concession route, whatever it means, is it a PPP, is it through a DFI? I think those are going to go. It's not that, you know, government runs that they've got control of the purse. We're not going to do that. I can promise you, we're not going to do If we don't have a say, even though that we fix income investors, we're not equity investors, we'll also, and remember that one slide I showed you, that debt investor protection is the key here. So we'll make sure that what we call there's a debt officer. I don't know if you know that the JSE rules have now changed, that every company has got to have a, a debt officer now that looks after our interest on the board. So on those things, we will make sure, we'll put it in, in the contract, we want a debt officer that looks after the interest of the fixed income note holders, and if transit doesn't like it, well, tough. You know, that type of thing. So those become non-negotiables for us. Um, yes, you're right. So we will look after, so we can get confidence back into the system that these guys will actually use the money for what they, we let it slip. So we know this. I mean, I will take blame for what Dupin Cusilla as well. We let it slip. When ESCOM started, they said to us, you know, they came, came and said to our table, look, we're going to build these two wonderful power stations, Mudupi and Kusili. It's going to cost 60 billion and we're going to run like clockwork. Today, 15 years later, it's cost 200 billion and not one of them is working. So we let it slip. I, I must, the fixed income market should take a, a beating for that one in the sense that we let it slip. I don't think we're going to, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, I think. So we're not going to try and let it slip. But there's legislation. There's only so much we can do. You know, the government also doesn't want to be ruled by capital, but capital can also stay away, which they are finding out. It's a, it is a different world. Sorry. <laughs> is this still on? Yes, it's still on. Uh, I was very quiet, just in case it wasn't. Uh, just in case it was. You said on a couple of slides ago, Ian, that um, we need to do this. Now, Maybe we're from a peculiarly uh, small part, portion of the um, pension fund arena. Defined benefit with a ring-fenced fund. So no more income coming in, just the money that we have. But we need to do that. And if we're looking after the members' uh, best rights with decreasing coupons uh, because someone else gets the benefit of uh, meeting some governmentally arbitrarily arrived standards. It just doesn't stack up. Yeah, I think it's, it's particularly a hard thing for you if you don't have income coming in. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be differences. But, but it can also go the other way. These guys don't meet the hurdles and then the coupon will go up. Okay. But we're talking about 20 or 15, ba 15 or 20 basis points, right? So if the overall, so I mean for you as a fund, you've still got to work out that if the coupon overall makes sense, so, so you work out, let's say inflation in South Africa in the next five years is 4% or 4.5%, but the coupon that you're going to get is 9% or 8%, right? Even if you go to 775, you're still going to have a real return for your investors. Now that's what you want, right? Because you've got a defined benefit fund. You want to still outperform inflation so you can give your beneficiaries a CPI plus type, type return. So, Look, I don't think the 15 basis points should be the game breaker for you up or down if the total return still meets your hurdle. But it will mean they don't get the 8%, so they get the 780s or whatever the number is. But the total return still makes sense. So you've got to, you've got to do that some. Yes, but why, if I could come back, uh, Ian, sorry. Um, why should the, uh, the risk be at the door of the fund who puts the money in in the first place. There are lots of agencies, it was said this morning by Anne, one of the ladies in the first, first up at nine o'clock, we haven't got to solve the world's problems, you know? And we're being roped into this by, by the way that you're, you're suggesting uh, the system should be structured or restructured. No, sure. Emerging markets are in the middle of, emerging markets weren't the cause of this, but we are being, being roped into it, that's, that's a fair comment. But look, it's up to the asset manager to decide to, to put it in or not put it in. Um, but for us, if the total return still, the real return, the real risk adjusted return still makes sense, and we do get the benefit of being more sustainable, lower carbon footprint, we'll do it, but not at the expense or risk of investors. All we're saying to you is, this is, this is probably where we're going. To what magnitude we're doing it, I think that's still, that's still open for debate. But if the real return makes sense, why not do it? And, and, we, and it's for the betterment of society. So that's why I ask about greeniums. Is our investors ready for it? That's why I ask the question. Yes, ma'am, sorry. 
thank you very much, Ian, about your representation. And I'm so glad to take this opportunity as a worker, also staying in a community, sitting here as a trustee. I was about to ask a, a, a time frame of what you want to achieve. But just now, you've just answered that it's still in the process of debate. Reason being that why I'm raising this, we can see that our country, especially economically, is collapsing. And as a person staying in the community where we use ESCOM, it's very painful. And we can see also that ESCOM is dying. So <laughs> let's hope what you are planning to achieve will succeed, especially in this IPP. Recently, last week also, I was attending just for sharing AIDS a workshop. All these things were represented. Then it, it's showing that somewhere along the line, we can't run away, that our country is collapsing. But at the end of the day, it needs to be rescued. I'm so happy to be in this plenary. And when I go back to deliver, although it's still in debate, I wish that it can be successful and you'll get, you'll get it within a short space of periods because we know that it, it won't be happen tomorrow because Rome was not built in one day. It took years. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the comment. And I just want to, to clarify one thing about open-ended. This is, this is not totally open-ended. We've set very hard targets in a, in a sense for 2030, nine years from now, that we need to achieve. So I, I don't want to mislead you and say, look, it's all going to be ready and perfect by 2030. But I had to commit myself and my team to 2030 goals, where we need um, carbon footprints to be of the the companies that we invest with, and you can work out that Eskom and Sassel and Cup and SAPI and SAB and all these, these polluters are. So there's, there's a 2030 goal here. So I don't want to say to you this is something that's going to happen in our great great grandchildren. We've got a nine year limit. And it's also not just, okay, we're going to do nothing until 2030 and then we're just going to, every year, there's going to be, rev we're going to revisit where we are. So let's say, short increments, but let's say by 2025, there's going to be a, a, a big review of, okay, where are these guys? They've got five years to go type thing. And, and if they don't meet the targets, well, then, you know, they, they could be excluded from our investment horizon, if you want to say that. So we, this, is not, this is not open ended. There's, there's definite timelines here for us as an investment process, definitely. Any other questions on sustainability? But please, as the trustees of a, of, a, of a pension fund or a board, please have that discussion around benchmarks. If you need me to come and present to your board or your investment committee uh, to talk around this, I'm very happy to, to come and do it for you. We can have an open discussion as, as boards and trustees. We do it as asset managers. Uh, we, wa we would like to have that engagement with the principal office, officers and trustees of pension funds, defined benefit, defined contribution, annuities, guarantees, whatever you, we, we need to talk about, what we're going to do here, because it's, it's important to us and it is the way we're going to, to do it and we don't want to be left behind. I think that's the point. We don't want to be left behind and suddenly you work out, the world has moved there and we're still here. Uh, we want to be part of that process. So very happy to engage with boards and investment committees where you need it so we can have this discussion on a more one-on-one -on -one and, and wider boards. Can, can we as Momentum quite happy to, to have that discussion with you. Right, thank you everybody. Okay, thank you. thank you very much everyone. The next session is going to start at quarter past three. It's um, in each of the different uh, rooms. 
The one that's going to be held here is the one by Net Group Investments, and the title is Implementing Responsible Investment Principles into Passive Investment Strategies. So if you are staying for that session, you're welcome to have a leg stretch. Otherwise, please make your way to the next room. Thank you.